Hello everyone, my name is Timothy Nguyen, and in this video I will be explaining some of my original research on quantum Yang-Mills theory in two dimensions. It's still work in progress, but I feel it's reached a mature enough stage to present as a whole. The original questions that I ask, and the diversity of techniques I employ, are what I hope to convey to the wider research community in this video. Thank you for your attention. There are two outstanding paradigms for analyzing quantum Yang-Mills theory. The first is the formal perturbative approach, which uses continuum gauge fields. Here, the basic field is a connection one form A on some vector bundle. The structure group of this bundle is called the gauge group, and it is given by some compact Lie group G. The perturbative approach computes quantities using the Feynman diagram method in which the full range of quantum field theoretic techniques involving regularization, renormalization, and gauge fixing come into play. This Feynman diagrammatic method has been the cornerstone of higher energy physics, beginning with the early success of quantum electrodynamics in the previous century and culminating in the recent discovery of the Higgs boson. The second approach to quantum Yang-Mills theory when working in Euclidean signature involves using a lattice. In this approach, the gauge fields are now group-valued elements on the edges of a lattice. The advantage of this approach is that all integrals become well-defined. They are integrals over finitely many products of the compact gauge group, one copy for each edge of the finite lattice. This approach has also meant great success or numerical Monte Carlo simulations have yielded excellent agreement with experimental data. In both the perturbative and lattice formulations, we have a coupling constant arising from the classical action of Yang-Mills theory. Physicists will denote such a constant by E squared or G squared, but I'll just call it lambda zero. In two-dimensional Yang-Mills, the action involves the Hodge star, mapping two forms to zero forms. This involves division by an area form. Hence, 2D Yang-Mills requires as input an area form, and as a consequence, the meaningful dimensionless coupling constant to consider is lambda, which is given by lambda zero times some reference area element. In the lattice formulation of Yang-Mills theory, all quantities are expressed as honest functions of lambda. In the perturbative formulation, all quantities are expressed as a formal series in lambda. In my paper, I ask the following question, which to the best of my knowledge has not been previously asked, much less addressed using precisely formulated mathematics. For Yang-Mills theory, what is the relationship between the perturbative results obtained in the continuum formulation and the non-perturbative results obtained from the continuum limit of the lattice formulation as the coupling constant is sent to zero. More precisely, since Feynman diagrams are to serve as a series approximation, given some observable O, do perturbative expectation values provide an asymptotic series for the exact expectations obtained from the lattice in the continuum limit as lambda goes to zero? From the point of view of physics, this is a fundamental question because it is asking whether two established yet remarkably different paradigms of physics are consistent in the expected manner. On the side of mathematics, a preliminary obstacle involves formulating the question in a mathematically precise way. The perturbative formulation, though unfamiliar to most mathematicians, can be made into rigorous mathematics after learning the machinery. You can refer to one of my papers for an introductory sketch. For the lattice formulation, the main difficulty consists in knowing how to perform the continuum limit rigorously. This is a notoriously difficult problem in dimensions 3 and 4, and it is part of the reason why the Yang-Mills mass gap is a millennium problem. But in dimension 2, there is a remarkably elegant and well-known continuum limit of Yang-Mills theory on the lattice, due to Migdal and Witten. In this formulation, expectation values of the basic observables, namely Wilson loops, can be described in terms of explicit formulas involving heat kernels on the gauge group. Recall that a Wilson loop in the continuum theory 
is a gauge invariant functional that takes a connection A, computes its holonomy about a closed loop gamma, and then applies the conjugation invariant function F to the resulting group valued element. The lattice expectation uses a discretized version of such a Wilson loop observable. What makes the mcdahl witten lattice formulation soluble is that the theory is invariant under subdivision of the lattice, so that the continuum limit is essentially already performed on any finite lattice. This is not the case with the Wilson action, typically used in higher dimensions. Thus, the precise question my paper studies concerns whether for two-dimensional Yang-Mills theory, given a surface equipped with an area form, do perturbative Wilson loop expectations, given by a formal expansion in terms of Feynman diagrams, capture the asymptotics of the exact lattice Wilson loop expectations in the limit as the Yang-Mills coupling constant goes to zero? I believe that this is a fundamental question, not only for the reasons I have already mentioned, but also because of its context within contemporary approaches to quantum field theory. Currently, there are many different subfields of quantum field theory, each with their own methodologies. It's my impression that most of the work being done involves studying the mathematics inspired from quantum field theory, rather than the mathematics underlying quantum field theory itself. My personal belief is that fundamental progress in understanding quantum field theory will happen by examining the core structure of quantum field theory itself, with the question I pose being one piece of that puzzle. In my investigation so far, I have answered this question in the affirmative in a variety of subtle and nuanced ways. In the rest of this video, I'll be providing a sketch of my results to give a big picture for those interested in learning more. Some technical terminology will be unavoidable, and I'll also have to leave out a lot of details and complete definitions, but I hope the overview I provide may be helpful for those wanting to get a glimpse of the ideas and techniques I've employed. I've organized the results of my trio of papers on quantum Yang-Mills theory into the following somewhat elaborate diagram. Let's go through it step by step. For technical reasons, my study of 2D Yang-Mills is primarily focused on the two-sphere and R2, where we can think of R2 as the limit in which we decompactify S2. That is, we let the area of S2 go to infinity. In comparing perturbation theory to the migdal witten lattice formulation, a gauge-fixing condition must be chosen for perturbation theory. This is because only after choosing a gauge do we get a well-defined Feynman diagram expansion in perturbation theory. My results involve a systematic analysis of various gauges that naturally occur. Let's first discuss Coulomb gauge, also known as Landau gauge. This gauge requires the choice of an auxiliary Ribbonian metric, which we should choose to be compatible with the area form we started out with. From this, we can impose the Coulomb gauge fixing condition, which is that d star a equals zero. Physically, this is eliminating longitudinal modes of the gauge field. My first result is that Wilson loop expectation values evaluated using Coulomb gauge are independent of the choice of gauge fixing metric. That is, the sum over Feynman diagrams that results from the Wilson loop expectation while requiring a choice of metric to be constructed does not depend on which choice we make. While such independence is to be expected on physical grounds, Establishing gauge invariance is usually done very formally in the physics literature, using, for example, the methods of fadeyev popov gauge fixing, or BRST symmetry. I establish gauge invariance using the rigorous formulation of the batalin vilkovsky method, as developed recently by Kevin Costello. The power of this formalism, which involves a delicate interplay between analysis and homological algebra, stems from its ability to analyze how symmetries are manifest in a quantum theory, in particular, gauge invariance. While this formalism is quite technical, it is the only rigorous general formulation of the batal and vilkovsky quantization method in Euclidean signature that I am aware of. Establishing gauge invariance using this formalism is thus an important step in making essential features of perturbative Yang-Mills theory mathematically rigorous. So going back to our main diagram, 
our result on Coulomb gauge is indicated by the highlighted area. This result is essentially an a priori result. Namely, it provides a prerequisite for having a well-defined theory. Expectation values of observables are independent of the choice of gauge fixing, so that the question I pose about such expectations makes sense. The next gauge I consider is holomorphic gauge. Here, the space of gauge fields is complexified. In other words, our gauge group G is replaced by its complexification G sub C. Our complexified gauge field now has DZ and DZ bar components and holomorphic gauge sets the dz bar component equal to zero. Some thought shows that this is not actually an honest gauge fixing condition, and so for the time being, it's just an ansatz. See my papers for how to interpret holomorphic gauge as a gauge fixing condition. My main result here is that holomorphic gauge is equivalent to Coulomb gauge, that is, Wilson loop expectations computed with respect to these gauges agree. This involves combining the batalin vilkovsky method with complexification. Mathematically, this result is quite surprising, since the kinds of Feynman diagrams we get in holomorphic gauge differ greatly from the ones that we get in Coulomb gauge. In holomorphic gauge, the Yang-Mills action is quadratic, since the quadratic term in the curvature tensor vanishes. In Coulomb gauge, the nonlinear terms in the curvature remain and we have higher order interactions. And so the benefit of this theorem is that Wilson loop expectations computed in holomorphic gauge, while still non-trivial, are much simpler to evaluate than in Coulomb gauge. Going back to our main diagram, we now have the highlighted equality. My results on Coulomb and holomorphic gauge thus far are structural results. Now I'll present some of my computational results. I've been able to compute Wilson loop expectations when I decompactify to R2. Let's look at this part of the diagram. For holomorphic gauge on R2, I show the following. Let gamma be a simple closed curve that encloses a region of area rho. Then the perturbative expectation up to second order in lambda, that is, up to an error of order lambda cubed, is given by the following Gaussian matrix integral over the Lie algebra. This is a rather fascinating and mysterious result. The right-hand side is precisely the kind of integral that appears in random matrix theory, for example, those arising from the Gaussian unitary ensemble. Moreover, the right-hand side is what you'd expect to get from computing asymptotics of the exact expectation in the appropriate way so that this result provides positive confirmation to our main question relating perturbation theory to the exact theory. The proof of this result involves exploiting homotopy invariance properties of iterated integrals occurring in the Feynman diagrammatic expansion in holomorphic gauge. Returning to our diagram, this yields the O of lambda cubed result. The WML arrow denotes that holomorphic gauge is equivalent to what's called the wu mandelstam Lebrandt regularization of axial gauge on R2. Axial gauge, recall, is when we gauge away a component of the gauge field along a coordinate direction, say the y direction. The exact details of WML aren't so important, but what's important is that there is a different way to regularize axial gauge using stochastic methods. Namely, we can use white noise analysis to obtain a different set of Feynman diagrams for Wilson loop expectations in axial gauge, the result of which I call stochastic axial gauge. In fact, there are two different ways of doing this, partial axial gauge and complete axial gauge. In my most recent paper, I establish the equivalence between these two gauges and equality with the exact lattice expectation. This is a much stronger statement than the perturbative expectation yielding an asymptotic series for the exact expectation. The two quantities are in fact equal. In one sense, this is not so surprising, since in axial gauge, the action is purely quadratic. This implies that the Yang-Mills path integral in complete axial gauge yields for us a Gaussian measure, so that computing the exact expectation is equivalent to computing Feynman diagrams using Wick's theorem. On the other hand, 
holomorphic gauge on R2, which involves the different WML regulator for axial gauge, is inequivalent to stochastic axial gauge. This is the bifurcation in my diagram. The lesson from this is that the absence of interactions in axial gauge doesn't mean that the result in quantum field theory is trivial, since we can obtain distinct gauges depending on how we regularize. The discrepancy between the two gauges can be understood from the non-commutativity of taking two limits. Stochastic axial gauge is obtained from decompactifying to R2 and then computing asymptotics. Holomorphic gauge is obtained from computing asymptotics on S2 and then decompactifying. These two different orders in taking limits are inequivalent, as you can read about more in my papers. My analysis of stochastic axial gauge requires some rather new ideas. I use an original discretization method that occurs in a formalism I developed, which I call algebraic stochastic calculus. In ordinary stochastic calculus, Gaussian free fields have positive definite covariance matrix. Algebraic stochastic calculus allows this covariance matrix to be indefinite. This is a very unnatural thing to do if you're a probabilist, since such a mathematical structure cannot possibly arise from measure theoretic notions. The nature of the results I obtain I regard as very mysterious, since they provide a bridge between the aspects of quantum field theory that arise from a measure to those that do not. Currently, I am working to understand, among other things, the asymptotics of Wilson loop expectations on S2 in holomorphic gauge, both without decompactification and with decompactification, and trying to extend the second order result to higher order. The belief is that the perturbative expectation should yield agreement with the lattice expectation to all orders in lambda, thus confirming the tacitly assumed paradigm that formal continuum perturbation theory is consistent with lattice computations in the case of 2D Yang-Mills. But the full story remains to be uncovered. There are other interesting questions one can ask about 2D Yang-Mills related to my work, and I list some of these at the end of my paper. For me personally, I think it is remarkable how rich this subject has developed into, as it draws upon a wide array of mathematical tools and fields. An ambitious goal would be to see to what extent the methods developed here for two dimensions can be bootstrapped to go to three and four dimensions, for which any meaningful progress would be truly significant. But that will have to be the subject of another video.